I see things in a slightly different way as color slowly fades into a world of black and white. This is a true story about a journey told through a sequence of black and white images that take the viewer on a dark trip through different lands and into an ethereal world. A world that unlocks the door to a ghostly encounter. A place of reflections, mythical legends and dramatic landscapes sculptured by wind and rain, dark woods watched over by secret forest creatures, brooding dark skyscapes with otherworldly shafts of light piercing ink black skies. Lonely ancient trees, centuries old, that tell so many stories where lovers once met high up on windswept moors. Or the weather bleached skeletal remains of some poor creature that found its final resting place. Sometimes the simplest of subjects create the most rewarding and intriguing results and are often unintentional, whether lost in the back streets of Prague or the relentless howling Atlantic gales on the Irish coast. I remember being in downtown New Orleans after a torrential downpour. As I crossed the street, something caught my eye. In the middle of the road was an iron manhole cover with the perfect mirror-like reflection of a skyscraper, so spectacular but totally unnoticed by passers-by. I have often been asked if I believe in the supernatural or ghosts, as some people like to call them, as my work always portrays a dark and brooding atmosphere. I certainly believe that buildings or locations can somehow retain a memory of past events. I think that whatever events there may have been are deeply embedded into the fabric foundations and surroundings of that place. A little bit like when an old door is stripped of its paint, each layer reveals another colour from a different era and point of time. The paint from each era is still there, but you have to peel back the layers to search what you are looking for. On more than one occasion, when I have been visiting a place, I have certainly sensed that I was not alone. I cannot explain why, it's just a feeling I have had. Several times I have experienced strange smells from within a building, but one particular smell is that of tobacco or pipe smoke. It's almost as if the location is stored within its foundations, a piece of its past, and just wants to remind me that something is still there. Over the years, I have traveled far and wide, photographing different locations around the world. Ever since a child, I have always had a fascination in tales of the supernatural, and this has been reflected in the way I photograph my work. I am naturally attracted to subjects that I feel can tell a visual story, whether it's a castle, crumbling mansion, wild barren landscape, or abandoned hotel. I always get the uneasy sense when visiting these locations of two separate worlds, a past, a present, and us, and them. I never feel alone, as I always feel someone is with me, quietly observing. A lot of my earlier work was shot on grainy black and white film. 
in the days when you would get a roll of film consisting of 36 shots. There was always something magical about processing the film in the darkroom and spoiling out the fresh wet negatives, holding them up to the light to see the first few shots. The smell of fixer in the darkroom is something you never forget, a strong vinegar vapour which you could smell for days. For the past few years, I have shot digitally with storage cards that can hold thousands of photographs. The excitement is still there, but in a different way. That comes from digitally enhancing the photographs when I come back from a location. One thing that is in common with film and digital is in the way in which I shoot my work. I have always used one camera and one lens. That's it. Simple. No hassle. Cameras come and go, but I still work today using this basic method. Before I get to negative 29A, the only photograph that I have taken which I cannot explain and the only time I have ever had reason to question what I have photographed. I would like to tell you a short story about an old mansion I visited. A few years ago, I was commissioned to take several photographs for a book publisher at a 16th century mansion in Wales. After two hours of driving along narrow country lanes with rain lashing the windscreen, I finally found the turning. As I made my way up the long gravel drive, trying not to fall into the potholes, the old mansion appeared from behind several large oak trees. It looked an imposing pile, with lead crystal windows partly hidden by thick green clumps of overgrown ivy. As I looked up, several tall chimneys leaned slightly against the slate grey sky, Approaching the arched wooden door, I noticed steps leading down to a large pond, surrounded by box hedging and three statues which had seen better days. I was welcomed into the black and white tiled porch by the housekeeper who took my coat and hung it up on a hook to dry. They then took me along a dark corridor which was like a museum of fine art paintings in chunky gold frames to meet the owner, Mr. Corbett. He looked and was quite a jolly chap, perhaps in his early 80s. I briefly explained why I was there and how the photographs would be used. He said before I start, he would give me a guided tour of the house and also take me to the room where the ornate 16th century carvings were. With difficulty, he heaved himself from where he was sitting at the kitchen table. Grabbing his walking stick, he winked at me and said, Come on lads, let's go. The house had been in the family for many generations, and the current owner, Mr. Corbett, had lived here since his early 20s. We made our way back along the long corridor where I entered the house. We moved slowly into their drawing room, once again filled with paintings of family members and horse portraits. I distinctly remember the smell of the house, a mixture of wood polish and soot from the open fires in rooms that were rarely aired. The centerpiece of the room was a massive twisty oak beam covered in woodburn arching over the mantle of the fireplace. As we chatted, the low whirring of the cogs from the grandfather clock could be heard before letting out a chime that seemed to echo throughout the entire house. As we shut the door behind us, we made our way to the bottom of the stairs. The wooden steps sunk in the middle of each one where over the years the footfall had slowly worn them away. 
The dark, heavy wooden panelling matched that of the colour of the stairs. Even with the light on, it was still difficult to see. As we turned on the staircase to make our way up another flight of creaky steps, Mr. Corbett suddenly raised his walking stick and struck with an almighty blow a fully stuffed crocodile on the head and then said, I shot that bugger in our lake, you know. We both laughed and I thought to myself, I'm pretty sure crocodiles are not a native species to whales. He obviously had a great sense of humour. As we made our way to the top of the stairs, we approached a small landing. Well, this is it, he said, as he twisted the brass door handle and slowly opened what must be the largest room I had ever seen in any house. To the right hand side, which was the front of the building, there must have been at least twelve large windows that looked out across the courtyard towards the dovecot. Again, the room was covered from floor to ceiling in heavy, dark wooden panelling. At the far end of the room, tucked into the corner, was a huge four-poster bed covered in an ornate fabric. As we approached the bed, he said, There they are. On the end of the wooden bed, were several carved wooden figures about half my height. Mr. Corbett turned without saying anything and returned downstairs to the kitchen where his housekeeper was preparing lunch for him. I proceeded to set up my light and equipment to take the photographs required. I do remember thinking to myself that the wooden carvings were incredibly creepy and how on earth it would be possible to sleep at night with these standing at the end of the bed. As I worked away, I sensed that the room was getting cooler. I certainly felt very alone in that room. After packing all of my equipment into the car, I went back into the house to say goodbye to Mr. Corbett. He was sitting at the end of a long yellow table in his overheated kitchen with a large red napkin tucked into the collar of his shirt, face glowing from the good lunch. He looked up to me as he wiped gravy from his mouth. All done? he asked. I told him I was very happy with the photographs I had taken and we proceeded to chat for a while. He told me he had lived alone in the house for quite a few years after his wife had passed away. I asked him if he ever felt alone in such a large house. He said, No, never, it's just me and the ghosts. I asked if he was serious, and he told me there were several ghosts that occupy the house. Occasionally, he would see one entering a room. But, he told me there was one ghost he seemed to be a little bit afraid of. Sometimes, in the early hours of the morning, crying could be heard from the room where I had spent most of my day. This, according to Mr. Corbett, was the most haunted room in the entire house, the only room with the crying child. As I have been telling this story, you will have seen many of my photographs from my travels around the world. I find great excitement and anticipation when visiting somewhere new 
such as a remote woodland castle perched on a rocky outcrop. I am always looking for an alternative angle or viewpoint that has a certain something that will make the photograph come more alive. Trees always play an important role in my work and how the shape and texture can be used to frame a subject or even use the gnarled spindly branches in a way that they look like fingers reaching out to touch or guide the way. Often I come across little things that most people pass by or something that is a little hidden. A practice I like to use is to invert or flip the photograph. This will create a whole new look and atmosphere. Sometimes this world can lead to hidden doors that enter the underworld, a parallel universe that is by invitation only. Perhaps some people or even animals are more sensitive to forming this connection. It is scientifically proven that animals have a much higher sensitivity than humans. This has often been proved when natural disasters around the world have occurred with recordings of a heightened erratic increase in certain animals anything from several hours to several days before an event. Only a few places that I have visited have a genuine presence of unease and one in particular that made me feel I was not alone. I did not feel like this when I was there. I only felt like this several weeks later having looked at the photograph that I had taken. I have not been back to this location for 12 years as I photographed something that I could not explain, something that was not there when I took the photograph. I certainly have an open mind that these doors and entrances could possibly be all around us when everything is lined up for that brief moment in time for whatever reason these two worlds connect. They are often places of very historical interest and I'm sure past events from these places linger for many years dormant, waiting. Once again the connection that we have to water is something I feel has some spiritual contact to another world. The way that it shimmers in sunlight, the silky movement when touched by hand, boat or wind, and how reflections come and go and are never ever the same. By far one of the most atmospheric locations I have ever visited and possibly one of the most haunted cities in the whole world from its magnificent lagoon location with ornate baroque palaces to hidden marble piazzas. A city with contrasts of stunning architecture, narrow freshly washed linen covered alleyways, grotesque paper mashy masks, crumbling plaster facades and the constant echo of vaporettos chugging along canals. The city of Venice is as romantic as it is haunting. In the early hours of the morning on Friday the 17th of February 2006, I made my way along the narrow dark street passing the Basilica of Santa Maria della Salute which stood elegantly against a pitch black skyline watching Venice as it sleeps, pausing for a few moments to observe the lonely gondolas waiting for the next paying guests. I was about to take my last photograph in Venice. Unknown to me at the time, it would also be the most intriguing photograph that I have ever taken. In the shadow of the Rialto Bridge, my invitation had come.
In the darkness that night, I had unknowingly photographed something very unusual, something that should not exist. This has become known as negative 29A. A well-known 16th century ghost that haunts the Grand Canal. <laughs>